In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has experienced what it is to be human. Christ has been there before me. Christ stands beside me. Christ will always hold me in his hand, no matter what life brings. Do we accept the challenge to welcome Christ into our hearts and homes this Christmas? May the Christmas season be a time of real joy for us all as we rejoice that God is with us in this child who is the Son of the Father, the Word made flesh. and welcome to this season of Invited. Thank you so much for responding to God's invitation to come and find out more. And an even bigger thank you if you have invited somebody new to come with you and join this experience, because that is what we are called to do, share the good news of Jesus Christ. We are here to help us to prepare for the joyful celebration that is Christmas. And we are here at the Diocesan Cathedral in Arundel, which this year has celebrated its 150th anniversary. Cathedrals are so important to our faith. They are the focus for our local community, um, but also they help us to um, really understand and visualize our solidarity with the Universal Church. In fact, when uh, a funny story that Bishop Richard uh, told once, uh, he uh, moved to the area after he was made bishop. And as you do, you have to register with the local GP. Um, and I, I remember he said that he went along to the GP and they said, well, we'll need a letter from your line manager to just make sure that you, know, you are you know, moving to the area for a reason. And he said to them very nicely, my line manager is the Pope. So we are very distinctly connected to the Universal Church through our bishop, whose uh, cathedral here is in Arundel. We are going to be looking uh, this season uh, very much at the person of Jesus, and we're going to be looking at him from a variety of perspectives. So our first speaker today to help us on this journey to find out more about Jesus is Barnabas. Barnabas grew up in Rottingdean as a parishioner of Our Lady of Lourdes. After studying theology at Durham University, he worked at Cranbrook School for a while. Now he has entered formation for the priesthood and is currently at the Venerable English College in Rome, where he is currently in his second year studying philosophy. When he visits Sussex uh, during his vacation, he enjoys going for walks along, along the South Downs and going to the seaside with his dog, Ivor. And he's going to speak to us today about the historical person of Jesus, how he takes a particular place in human history and why that is so important. So over to you, Barnabas. As we begin, I invite you to join me in praying the Angelus. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt amongst us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, most holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. When God asked Mary if she would be the mother of his divine Son, creation held its breath, because on her very words hung the balance of our salvation and that of the whole world. Say yes, Mary. Say yes, and all shall be renewed. What mystery it is already that before the Son is conceived by the Holy Spirit, Mary accepts unreservedly God's will for her without counting the personal cost. Finally, those tenacious words are said, and creation sighs. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Finally, 
the unthinkable has happened, that which the prophets foretold, but the people of Israel could not understand. Something so scandalous and yet so beautiful, so simple yet so incomprehensible. The Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Incarnation. The Incarnation, the saving remedy, the ransoming of man back from the grip of the evil one. It saved the pagans, grasping in the dark with their myths and sordid sacrifices, yet still paying homage to the unknown God whom Socrates recognized in his fatal pursuit of truth. It saved the people of Israel after their countless infidelities to the Father, broken under the law because they were too weak to obey it. Now, the second Eve, Mary most holy, undoes the disobedience of the first mother of mankind by becoming the mother of God and the church. Now the second Adam, come to redeem the world, is knit in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. Thirty-three years later, he will undo the sin of the first Adam, wrought with the tree of knowledge, with another tree, the tree reserved for the fools and the reprobates, the tree that we venerate, the tree of the cross. Sing choirs of angels, sing, sing in exultation, because God is made man, and sin and death will be conquered by his most precious blood. A baby is born whose hands are too small to even hold a clump of hay, and hell trembles at the sight. The life of the Holy Family was not easy. Soon after his birth, Mary presents Jesus to the Lord in the temple, and amidst the joy of Simeon saying to the Father, Now you can dismiss your servant. I am ready to die, for I have seen the Saviour. Our Lady suffered the spiritual death of being told, our Lord will be taken from her, when he said, And your soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. The same hearts that outwardly said yes to the Incarnation less than a year before, now assents silently to the crucifixion in perfect obedience. They fled to Egypt to escape Herod when he tried to murder Jesus in his infancy. They were separated in Jerusalem when they left him in the temple. And all of his life, our Lord was preparing for the reason for his coming. Unlike any other man who was born to live, Jesus Christ came to die, that we may be saved. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. Why is it that we reverence this part of the Creed every Sunday? Why is the Incarnation given such special veneration? Because, ultimately, it is our faith, or at least the very foundation of it. But what actually is the Incarnation, and what is it not? Heresies in the Church's history have arisen over attempts to simplify the mystery of the Incarnation, and in doing so have denied it altogether. Arianism denied that Christ was God, whilst Apollinarianism denied that Christ was fully man. But it's essential to understand that Jesus didn't become part God or part man or that the divine and human nature mixed together to make a third strange substance. He took on himself human nature and so became fully man while remaining fully God. But in doing this, he didn't become a new person. He is always the Son, who was eternally begotten of the Father. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the Son assumed a human nature in order to accomplish our salvation in it. As St. Paul writes to the Philippians, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. As St. Thomas Aquinas says regarding this passage, Jesus, being one with the Father, is the perfect form of the Father. Our Lord himself said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. 
Whilst Satan tried to grasp at a higher nature, or at least tried to make his natural power his own, rather than accepting it as a gift from God, Christ, knowing full well he is divine, didn't insecurely cling to his divinity, but emptied himself. By emptying himself, Jesus didn't empty himself of his divinity, but he took on the emptiness of human nature, retaining the fullness of his divinity the whole time. This is what is meant by the term kenosis, the self-emptying of God. It's complicated, isn't it? We'll never truly understand this sacred mystery, but that's not what we're called to do. We're merely called to profess it in faith and contemplate it in prayer. Like our Blessed Lady, we're not doubting God's providence by asking, how can this be, so long as we trust, despite the limits of our understanding, that it is so. On the contrary, as her children, we're following her example. Like Our Lady, we are called to ponder these things in our heart. This is the night that even now, throughout the world, sets Christian believers apart from worldly vices and from the gloom of sin, leading them to grace and joining them to his holy ones. This is the night when Christ broke the prison bars of death and rose victorious from the underworld. Our birth would have been no gain had we not been redeemed. O wonder of your humble care for us, O love, O charity beyond all telling, to ransom a slave you gave away your son. O truly necessary sin of Adam, destroyed completely by the death of Christ, O happy fault that earned so great, so glorious a Redeemer. Why did the Incarnation happen, and what does it mean for us? The Exalted of the Easter Vigil that we've just heard a part of gives beautiful praise to the majesty of the Incarnation and its saving power for humanity. St Thomas Aquinas describes the Incarnation as necessary in the same way that a car is necessary for a journey. There are other ways to make that journey, but the car is the most fitting. Similarly, God could have saved mankind from sin without the Incarnation and death of our Lord, but it was the one that was the most fitting when it came to demonstrating his love for us and reconciling us to him. St. Augustine describes the Incarnation as the strongest proof of how deeply God loved us. To understand this, we merely have to look at our Lord's life. His life was a simple and mostly hidden one before he started his public ministry. Pope Benedict XVI said that the everyday obedience of Jesus to Joseph and Mary anticipated the obedience of Holy Thursday, restoring what the disobedience of Adam had destroyed. It is because it's so ordinary that it's so extraordinary. God was made man and worked diligently at the obedience of his mother and foster father Joseph. Not only are we saved by the glorious offering of the cross, but our ordinary life is sanctified by the countless days of work, play, growth and obedience which we all have in one way or another in common with our Lord. As Saint Athanasius tells us, God became man so that man may become God. Christ partakes in our human nature so that we may partake in his divine nature by being adopted sons of God through baptism and therefore being, yes, brothers of Jesus Christ. In this way, our humanity is glorified. And this is something that even the angels have caused to be envious of us for. For although they are in God's image, Christ did not take on their nature, and salvation was not offered to the angels who fell, like it has been for us fallen men and women. As stated in Gaudium et Spes, thanks to this belief, the church can anchor the dignity of human nature against all tides of opinion, for example, those which undervalue the human body or idolize it. By no human law can the personal dignity and liberty of man be so absolutely safeguarded as by the gospel of Christ, which has been entrusted to the church. The church, although constantly betrayed in her history by Judas and denied by Peter again and again in scandals and corruption by those entrusted to govern her, demonstrates her reverence for the individual made in the image and likeness of God, and the glorified by the Incarnation. Her hospitals, her schools, her charitable works, her communities, all seeing Christ in every human person, including the unborn. 
The incarnation shows us that the world is good, that our bodies are good, and through him we can be reconciled to ourselves and creation despite the destruction of the fall. Even the way Christ imparts his grace onto us is physical as well as spiritual. In the sacraments, most notably the Eucharist, where we are united with him, body and soul. As go the final words in the beautiful hymn, Bread of Heaven Beneath This Veil. For how can he deny me heaven, who here on earth himself hath given? But there is another consequence of the Incarnation that confronts not just the Church, but the whole world. When we gaze at the babe in the crib, it's easy for us to forget that Jesus is a divisive character who forces us to make a choice. He entered our world. He entered our suffering. He preached in the synagogue that the scriptures had been fulfilled. He forgave sin, cast out demons, healed the sick, and in the temple he threw tables and made a whip. He was and is a real man, a real character in our history, so real in fact that he splits our centuries in two, those of before and after his arrival. He called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. He called his first pope the rock on which he would build his church, and when he tempted him from his path to Calvary, he called him Satan. And he said that it would have been better for Judas had he never been born. He told us to suffer the little children, that the meek will inherit the earth, and that if we did not eat his flesh and drink his blood, we have no life within us. He claims to be God, and upon the cross asked God why he had forsaken him. He asked that the chalice of his death might pass him by at Gethsemane, and in true heroism he drank it in Calvary. He did not come merely as a teacher or solely as an example, but primarily as a saviour. This means we do not have the luxury of dismissing Christ as just another well-meaning moral teacher, simply a good man who we've misunderstood. As Venerable Fulton Sheen said, good men do not lie, but if Christ was not all that he said he was, the Son of the living God, the Word of God in the flesh, then he was not just a good man, he was a liar, a charlatan, and the greatest deceiver who ever lived. If he was not the Christ, he was the Antichrist. If he was only a man, then he was not even a good man. If we were to doubt Christ, we'd have to do it at least on the only possible terms. He was either a lunatic, or evil, or God. We must either dismiss him as a sad figure of madness, condemn him as a deceiver, or worship him as the saviour. The great paradox of our faith is that the frailty of God, the little baby in the manger, such a comforting image, familiar to many of us from childhood, is actually a great rebuke to the pride of the world, a challenge to sin and death, the unique and brilliant centre of our faith. But for those of us who acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Saviour, the Incarnation is our hope in a world that, for many, is a place of darkness and suffering. Not only did Christ enter into our pain when he sweat blood in Gethsemane, but he also redeemed it by that same blood in Calvary and conquered it in the tomb. Following Christ's glorified body, our bodies also await resurrection on the last day. Those of us facing loneliness this Christmas can take comfort that Christ felt abandoned on the cross, yet conquered death, saying, it is accomplished. Those of us afflicted with trauma or physical illness this Christmas can take comfort when we see the holes in Christ's hands and feet that, like his wounds, our wounds will be glorified. Those of us mourning loved ones this Christmas can hope that they too await the resurrection and that we may be united with them in the heavenly liturgy that is to come. The Word became flesh that we may be reconciled with God. The Word became flesh that we may know the unfathomable depths of God's love. The Word became flesh that we may, like the Word, be sons by the Holy Spirit in the Father's love. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to testify concerning the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he was to testify concerning the light. That was the true light, which enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God, to them that believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt amongst us, and we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Barnabas, for that wonderful talk. Um, and it inspires us to think a little bit more about who is Jesus to me? Who is Jesus to you? Is he the Lord of your life? So we're going to hear now from Julia. Julia is uh, very kindly given up her time to share with us today a little bit about who Jesus is for her and the impact that he has had on her life, continuing this idea of who is Jesus to all of us. Julia is the Director of Family and Children's Ministry at East Brighton Parish. She was fortunate enough to grow up in a predominantly Catholic culture on the island of Malta, and she moved to Brighton in 1997. In 2002, when her daughter was of an age to make her first Holy Communion, she started helping out as a volunteer in the parish with the first Holy Communion class. She has worked in sacramental preparation ever since. She's also a secondary school teacher and is currently working part-time as the head of RE in a local state secondary school in East Brighton. One of the highlights of her spiritual journey has been walking the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, um, and she did that in 2019. So let's head over to her now and hear what she has to say about her faith story. Hi, Julia, thank you so much for being with, the, with us today. It's, it's really lovely to have you here. As you know, this season is all about the person of Jesus. So let's start with a hopefully simple question, although it could get complex. <laughs> Who is Jesus to you? I think the, the best way for me to describe it would be to say that Jesus is kind of the foundation stone of my life. Um, it's the thing that is at the centre of my life and everything, you know, and everything comes from him. Everything radiates out from, from Jesus. He, from there, I get my sense of who I am, my own sense of identity as a disciple. I get the meaning and purpose in my life and it feeds into everything that I do and every relationship that I have. Um, and so for me it links into the, the, the parable that Jesus told about building your house on a rock. You know when you kind of building my house on a rock, building my life on Jesus, then it's on a solid firm foundation. Oh that's beautiful, thank you. <laughs> that's really really lovely. Have you always felt like that? Have you come to an understanding through your kind of faith journey? What's yeah. that been like? No, definitely it was something that it was a very slow progress for me. I wouldn't say for me that I had a, a particular moment in my life where I suddenly had a realisation or a conversion. For me, it was a very gradual, slow process over many years. Um, when, I, when I was young, I, although my family were nominally Christian and right. I was baptized as a baby, my family weren't really practicing. Um, but when I was six years old, I was fortunate enough that my family moved to Malta and I was brought up in Malta for the next sort of 10 years of my life, my formative years of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And it was there in Malta really that I, I learned about Jesus and about, uh, about Catholicism. It was a very Catholic culture to grow up in. Um, but even then, I don't think I really had the understanding or relationship that I have with Jesus now as a child or a teenager. I think very much when I was a, a, a younger age, I saw Jesus more as somebody that was sort of, you know, keeping an eye on me, wanting me to be good. Right. 
and yeah. maybe being a getting annoyed at me if I if I disobeyed or did something wrong. Sure. Um, I don't think that my my education, although it was a Catholic education, mm. it was very good. I learned a lot about about the Catholic faith. Mm. It didn't make me fall in love with Jesus. Right. Okay. You know, um, that came later uh, in my life, and I think I would say that what it took for me was a lot of hardship, failure, suffering and loss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, in my, in my teens, when I was 16, my family moved back to the UK. Right. And I would say then I felt quite cut off from my faith and that part of my background. And I kind of set off on my own, a bit like the lost sheep that wandered out of the sheepfold. You know, I kind of thought, I can, I'm fine, yeah. I don't need, I don't need, you know, faith, I don't need religion in my life, I'm happy to go out and build my life myself. Yeah. Um, and like everybody else, I kind of focused on a career and family, friendships, yeah. having a good time, yeah. um, you know, relationships, and, um, and that really was the story of my life through my 20s. I would say I, I drifted away from the church at that time. But then it was when things went wrong mm. in those areas mm. that I realized that, I realized that I'd built a house on sand, right. really. Sure. That yeah. my life didn't have a solid foundation, that all those things that were important to me could very easily be lost, could easily fail, and I failed in all of them. They all let me down in some way. Yeah. And so I kind of went through some difficult times, you know, like including the, the death of my mother when I was in my 20s. Yeah. My marriage broke up. And, um, and those years for me were very very kind of very dark, a time of grief. Yeah. I kind of felt like I'd failed and I was still quite young really. Mm. And I didn't really know where to look mm. Mm. to get myself out of that dark place. Right. And I guess what brought me back to the church was my daughter. Oh, wow. Because I have, I, I have a daughter, she's 28 now, but back then she was a little girl. And when she got to about the right age, I thought I wanted her to have an upbringing in the church like I had. Right, sure. And that was what brought me back. Yeah. So in a way, she led me back to, to my faith because I started taking her to mass. Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted her to make her first Holy Communion. And before I knew it, I was attending mass. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I was, somehow volunteered to be a member of the catechist Amazing. team for <laughs> First Holy Communion. I was asked to do children's liturgy and suddenly found myself kind of taking an active part okay. in the church. Yeah. And I was, but I still always had this, that feeling of grief that I talked okay. about. But then one day I just, after I'd been up for communion, I just remember kneeling down and kind of just really turning to Jesus and just saying, Jesus, you know, if you're there, mm. come and get me, come and mm. save me mm. and stop me feeling like this. Mm. And it wasn't immediate. It wasn't an immediate thing. Mm. There wasn't a change then. But looking back now, I can see that very gradually over, over the next few years, I was given the right invitations and callings. You know, people lent me books which completely changed my life when I read them. I found books in the street that also, <laughs> <laughs> also changed my life when I read them. I was just given the right people and the right opportunities at the right time. And I know that Jesus saved me, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that I know also now too that since then, other disasters have happened in my life. You yeah. know, I've failed at things. There've been other deaths. You know, things have gone wrong, mm. but it's different now because yeah. I don't have that feeling that if 
I lose my job or if a relationship fails or something like that, that mm. the bottom of my life has fallen out, mm. which is how it felt before. Mm. Mm. Now I feel like my life is on that solid foundation and that's Amazing. Jesus. And that can't be taken away. No. That's solid. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. God is so good. He works in such mysterious ways, but it's, it's phenomenal. Mm. And so I think it's, you know, I was going to ask you about how Jesus affects your life, how knowing him mm. in relationship. I think we've got a little bit of a sense of that, but is there anything else you wanted to add at all about, you know, what, what your life is like now that you have this relationship with him? I think just based on what I said before mm. about him giving me that sense of identity. Right. And I think that was really important for me sure. to kind of really develop that identity. And that was from being involved in the parish yeah. and the formation that I did in the parish. Um, that I kind of started to understand that I'm a disciple of okay, Jesus. Right. That's who I am. That yeah. was a, a revelation for me at the time. <laughs> me? <laughs> me, a disciple. Yeah. Um, I'm a disciple. Yeah. And then suddenly everything in my life kind of had a meaning. It, yeah. it had a purpose that right. my work you know, my, my family, my friendships, my relationships. Mm -hmm. So it gives a sense of purpose and meaning to all of that mm -hmm. that really wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we're going to go slightly different direction now. We've had a guest speaker that we've heard today. Mm -hmm. He's spoken about Jesus as a person in history. And I know there are a lot of people in our society and communities that, that just think, well, he was, he was a great man. He was a good teacher. He had some nice, if challenging messages, mm -hmm. but he was just a man. What would you say to them? Hmm. Well, funnily enough, I work in a school where I get asked that <laughs> quite a lot. As a teacher of RE, very sure. often my students kind of challenge me on that question as well. But also, I've studied and I've taught um, philosophy and ethics. Mm. And um, so I've studied lots of philosophers and ethical, moral teachers. Mm. But I would say if you look at them all, Jesus completely stands apart from all of those ethical teachers. Jesus right. is way more than that. Mm. Even if you just take an objective view as a student and look at all sort of other moral teachers yep. um, or, you know, philosophers, Jesus stands way above that. Mm. Mm. And it's not just in the teachings themselves or in the, or even in the kind of the depth and profundity of, of the parables, it's, there's also in the fact that his whole life mm. was a teaching and yeah. a kind of model and yeah. guide for us of yeah. how to live a, a yeah. spiritual life, sure. how to push through suffering and, yeah. and trust that you're going to come out the other side, yeah. that there's yeah. going to be a resurrection after, after our crucifixion, yeah. you know. And, um, and I just think that from per personally, from my own experience, that, you know, no other moral teacher has had the kind of impact on no. my life. I've studied lots of them. Okay. Um, yeah. They haven't had that same impact on my life. I haven't been, you know, to be able to turn to Jesus and ask him to come and help me, come and save me, and then to experience that yeah. in my life. Yeah. That, that's something far more than just some nice teachings. Absolutely. Yeah. That's real power at work in the world. Yeah. Amen. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, my last question to you, is it important to you personally that God <laughs> became man? And if so, why? <laughs> I think we can Definitely. say... Definitely. <laughs> yes. But I think actually, you know, there are... I can say why. I would say because of everything I've said yep. um, today, but also because of the fact that, you know, that knowledge that God is not just some, not, God is not just up there, yeah. separate from us, looking yeah. down, going, oh, what a mess they've made down there. Um, it's God, God has experienced what yeah. it is to be human. Yeah. And then therefore we can always turn to God yeah. because he knows what it is to go through what, what we all go through to suffer. Mm. to lose, to fail, to mm. be ridiculed, you mm. know, to feel ashamed. He, he's, he's experienced all of that with us. Mm. And also I think, you know, very often life feels chaotic and messy. Mm. Um, 
and the kind of knowledge that God came down into this mess, mm. that, you know, that he's there in it with us. I think that, that encourages me, yeah. that even if my, my life isn't all ordered and sorted and perfect, that God's still in it somehow, mm. because mm. he came down into, yeah. into this messy, yeah. into this messy world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. brilliant. Jill, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Um, I've loved hearing more thank about you. your story and I'm sure all our viewers at home will really be inspired by it. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. It was such a pleasure talking to you and hearing about your story and who Jesus is to you. And I hope sincerely that her story has inspired you to reflect a little bit on where he's been active in your life. And uh, to help you with your reflection, um, it's time to head over to you now in your groups or on your own to take some time to look at the resources that are available on the diocesan websites. Simply head to abdiocese.org.uk forward slash invited and you will find all the questions that will help you reflect more deeply and some prayers to help you to build your relationship with God. I look forward to seeing you next week where we'll be joined by the wonderful sister Kui who will help us to explore a little bit about ourselves and why we need more of Jesus in our lives. So I look forward to seeing you then. Have a wonderful week and God bless. Come to the Father, come one and all. You are invited, so take up the call. His mercy can cover what's gone before. So come as you are.